Playing a key role in, the, in, in, in ending the UFO ET truth embargo could well be the greatest achievement in life of many achievements. PRG thinks so and awarded our speaker the Hall of Fame Lifetime Achievement Award last year. At that time, he gave the 2008, 2008 keynote address. This year, PRG invited him to come and talk about the totality of his intersection with the UFO ET issue, the media response, the responses of his peers, and perhaps more importantly, his thoughts on the disclosure process and the post-disclosure world that most certainly lies ahead. Please welcome Dr. Edgar Mitchell to X Conference 2009. Good morning, all. And thank you for that overwhelming introduction. I uh, have to write that down myself so I can use it occasionally. <laughs> I'm a big picture person, and so this morning, very briefly, let's talk about the big picture. The 21st century that we're in, the 20th century was quite an amazing century, and the 21st is even going to be more. I think we will probably, in the 21st century, become a part of the community of planets that has intelligent life aboard. And uh, it's about time. When I speak to young people, which I do frequently, and they're <clears throat> just beginning to study history and science in their early schooling, <clears throat> I try to set the stage in the following way. I point out that my great-grandparents went across from Georgia to West Texas after the Civil War, our Civil War, to start a new life in the 1870s. <clears throat> Railroads weren't completed across the South and the West. They went in covered wagons pulled by horses. Lights weren't invented. My father was born shortly after the Wright brothers made their first flight, and I went to the moon. So from covered wagons, thank you from covered wagons to going to the moon was the mark of the late 19th and 20th century. And before that time, as we all know, people walked, rode horses, camels, whatever they could tame. The ancient Phoenicians started exploring the waters of the Mediterranean in their frail boats 4,000 or so years ago. The South Sea Islanders in their dugout canoes were exploring the South Pacific somewhere in that same time frame. Our parents' generation went into the air and our generation went into space. Does that progression tell you something? And we have had the rumors, and for a goodly portion of the 20th century, that we weren't alone in the universe but no one believed that. Even when I went to the moon in 1971, it was the conventional wisdom, both in science and religion and culture, that we were alone in the universe. And we now know that is simply not true. But coming to accommodate that in the larger sense is what we have to do, and that's what this century, I believe, is all about. And we are a major part of that right here in this room. Those of us in this room are leading the way to help get that idea out and operant in our culture. I also like to tell the story to help move this along. Now, we do have a little bit of time left, but I like to point out that our star is, no, is a mainstream star and not much different than most of the stars in the universe, it has a finite lifetime. Our star is about halfway through its life cycle, which means it has about 4, 4 billion years left. Now that seems like a, a lot of time to us, but in the life cycle of stars and the universe, it's not much. So if our species is to survive, we have to be off this planet before our sun burns up. Now that's the big picture that I like to set up because it's a part 
of our burgeoning science that we really didn't know at the beginning of the 20th century. The Big Bang idea of how all this came to be only began in the 1920s with Hubble's observing redshift. And it now looks like, and this is conjecture, it looks like the Big Bang is probably on its way out as a discussion or as a theory of how it all began. And it is very likely, and my team happens to be working on it very passionately, <clears throat> that the proper theory has to do with the steady state universe and the continuous creation of matter in the universe itself. And we will see how that plays out over the next decade or so, but I feel fairly confident that's what's happening. And there, if there's anything that should put a new light on this universe that we live in, or the universes, if it's plural, and I really don't know how you define other universes, except maybe the laws of physics aren't the same everywhere, so that would be a proper definition of a universe, that the law has a consistent laws of physics. And it's not necessary that it's the same laws that we have here, but we don't have a way of proving that at this point. In any event, we live it in challenging, magnificent, wonderful times, and one of the major things that we have to deal with in our lifetimes is one we're dealing with right now, is the fact that we are not alone in the universe. And as we examine what we have done in the last hundred years, we are not any longer on a sustainable path. Maybe we never were, but we're not on a sustainable path now. Because thanks to our science and technologies, the, the Industrial Revolution really didn't get underway in a strong way until the middle of the 19th century with the greats in science and improved medicine and science in the late 19th century. And into the 20th century, all of a sudden it took off with the population exploding from over 2 billion people at the beginning of the 20th century to 6.5 billion at the end of the 20th century and where we are now. And it appears from the best evidence that this planet can sustain the lifestyle and consumption patterns of Western industrial society for only about two billion people. So we got a problem. And it's up to us on the forefront of all of this to help resolve these issues and find ways to get along together. And it's very clear, it's very clear that we must put away these notions that the way we get along is to kill each other because our weapons that we have created thanks to the magnificence of our science and technologies in the 20th century, the weapons that we have created, if we don't learn to get along, we will surely use them on each other and that'll be the end of it altogether. So we in this room and those of like mind around us have an enormous challenge in the next few years, if we're going to set the stage with our children and grandchildren to keep this civilization going and this planet going, the challenge is ours. And I thank you for joining me that to, in that today. Thank you. Now, I think we can open the, open the floor to any feedback or question. That was at the, Air, was at the Walker Air Force Base, uh, along with Jesse Marcel. He was in the administrative department. And those folks wanted to get the story off their chest but not carry it to their grave. And they considered me a trustworthy subject to tell their story to because they couldn't tell it or wouldn't tell it because they were under threat. So I eventually took that story a few years ago to the Pentagon and asked the, at the level of the Joint Chiefs of Staff about it, told my story. And uh, was a short, long story short, had that confirmed that my story was correct, even though there were some people there, the admiral that I spoke to was himself unable to get clearance to go get into the project. But in any event, that's my story, and it's why I'm confident of telling this is because the old timers around Roswell, I have had no first-hand experience, even in the astronaut program, 
saw nothing on the moon, no villages, no structures, etc., like have been claimed, and have had no UFO experiences myself, except for the fact of meeting all of these fine research people, many of whom are here today who have written books about it and spent decades digging out the facts, plus my own experience with the old timers who told me their story of the Roswell. And that's why with my interest after my space flight and having an ep epiphany in, in space about the connectedness of everything, the interconnectedness of all things in the universe and life itself, and started my institute, the Noetic, Institute of Noetic Sciences, which most of you know about, to use, bring the tools of science to understand the issue of why are we conscious at all? What is consciousness? Because as you, many of you are well aware, for 400 years since the time of Rene Descartes, who came to the conclusion that body, mind, physicality, and spirituality belong to different realms of reality that didn't interact. From that time forward, it served a noble purpose at that time of getting the inquisition off the backs of the intellectuals of that period in time. But it also, we proceeded down that path for 400 years where consciousness, mind, and such things were not appropriate subjects for science until along came quantum mechanics in the early 20th century. And it's changed all of that, and we now know after, even though for most of the 20th century, the physicists have avoided, thanks to the Cartesian duality, have avoided the subject of consciousness, but now it's pretty obvious, and my team and a few others have worked on this in the latter part of the 20th century, and are very convinced that most of the so-called paranormal phenomena which cannot be explained within classical science and classical physics, can mostly be explained within quantum science. And that's what noetics is all about. That's what my work is mostly all about, is to apply that new understanding of the late 20th century in the quantum world that's helping revise biology, cosmology, and physics to account for many things that we call mysterious, mystical, uh, spiritual ideas from the very deep past. And it is, we still have a long ways to go. We uh, think we're a pretty smart species at this point in time, but frankly, we're just barely out of the trees. As I said, the uh, Industrial Revolution didn't really get going in full measure till the middle of the 19th century. And here we are just uh, 150 years later. That seems, for children, I guess, growing up and starting to study history, that sounds like a long time. But many of us in this room are close to 80 or so. Now, that's pretty much of a century, you know. And so 150 years doesn't seem like a lot of time to some of us. OK, are we back and so we can talk? Uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, my name is Bill. And uh, I have two questions. I hope I don't aggravate you with them. Go uh, ahead. Uh, and the, uh, there's a download of NASA videos that was never intended for public consumption, and it was by a TV ma manager station up in Canada, Stubbs. Uh, he had hundreds of hours of NASA download. I found that the one I find most interesting was the uh, mission STS-75, where there was a, a antenna, a tether antenna that broke off 12 miles long. And you see these things that are not airy disk, that are flying behind the antenna that are about three, uh, three miles in diameter that are pulsating. And it's in the invisible range because they said the NASA camera was in the ultraviolet range. But there seems to be life forms uh, that are beyond our uh, visibility. Uh, uh, or, or either that or the physics, uh, it could be a craft, you know, in a high energy state, mass in a high energy state. Well, let me interrupt you at this okay. point. Most of what you're talking about, I am, that's not in my area that I really consider myself expert. However, I tend to think at this point in time, uh, these so-called hidden areas, uh, there's not much doubt that cloaking devices, uh, we are starting to get a little bit of a handle on cloaking devices, but not as apparent that uh, our alien visitors have much more knowledge than that than we do. I personally, at, at the moment, do not think of when we start thinking about other dimensions, I think the evidence for that is pretty slim. That may be turned out that that's what it is. But uh, 
at the moment, I, I can't speak to that with the, what you're asking with authority. Okay, I have one more question. Go sir. ahead. Uh, you know, in the science, we see energy, we know how to manipulate it, all the different conversions, from mechanical to heat, and stuff like that. Yet, what is the essence of energy? What is the essence of energy? Is that your question? It, that's the question. What is the essence? I well, I don't think we know the answer to that any more than the fact that energy seems to be the fundamental stuff. Now, my model of it is that I call it, instead of dualism, which was the Cartesian notion, and dualism in quantum physics, particle, wave-particle duality, and the Cartesian duality, I think of terms in terms of dyads, are two faces of the same thing. So I, I express it this way. Energy is the fundamental stuff. And the way, we, the way we think of energy is as waveforms. Now, that's a simplistic modeling, but that's the way we do it. But I think in terms of dyads, that is, energy is the basis of matter, a la Einstein, energy equal mc squared. Uh, that is the energy of matter. But if we take <clears throat> the universe that we live in and know about, knowing is pretty fundamental too. And knowing based on information. And information is just basically patterns of energy. So we here have two faces of energy. One is it's matter. Our existence is dependent upon matter. Our knowing is dependent upon information. And we live in a universe that exists and knows. And that's a pretty fundamental definition. And that's the place I start. Now, there may be more complex and more other ways to look at it that can solve more problems. But at the moment, this dyadic model of existing and knowing based upon matter and the and the breaking down of matter into its energy components, which is what science does, and information as patterns of energy is a good way to look at it, and we're solving a lot of problems, particularly if we can now use the tools of, of quantum mechanics and relativity, but as many of you are aware, that putting quantum mechanics and relativity together has proven to be a very formidable task, and we haven't been successful with that yet. Oh, thank you, sir. You bet. I'm so honored that you're here today. And I'm, Thank you. I just want to share with you. I'm, a little closer to the mic, please. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm kind of intimidated by this. I said I'm quite honored to, to meet you today and to, uh, you know, to ask you some questions, of course. I'm, I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm a re rink and my son is the webmaster. We have MUFON in the bus all over. Anyhow, and what I wanted to ask you is... A little closer to it, please. What I wanted to ask you is about the, the moon, of course. And there's always the rumors that they say there's the dark side of the moon and that there is some kind of entities that are around that area that we don't see. And, of course, they say it's a satellite. So I have to ask you that. And then, of course, about Mars and the atmosphere is not you okay. know, as we see it as rain. Well, first of all, let's not <laughs> consider... consider <laughs> the dark side of the moon, because there isn't a dark side of the moon. Okay. There's a, the back side, which we don't see. But we have seen it. Those of us who have flown there have seen it. We've taken pictures of it. And it is markedly different than the front side. But that's largely because uh, in ancient times, and the Earth, the moon, thanks. Hey, you know, that's a good idea if somebody's standing in front of that light. It's right in my eyes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in ancient times, when the Earth-Moon system was brand new, mm -hmm. but the Moon was, had just been, had been captured, and it was stabilized in its orbit, mm -hmm. the, the lava inside the Moon came out as lava flows, like it does on Earth, mm -hmm. but it came out on the front side because of gravitational pull and filled all the craters on the front side. Now, the, the uh, ancients, it's the time of Galileo and so forth, uh, considered those dark areas on the moon as mare or seas. We now know that they're, they're just uh, craters filled with lava mm -hmm. and broken, pummeled by billions of years of uh, meteorite particles, mm -hmm. breaking them into very fine dust. Now the same thing happens on the backside, but it's not as much lava on the backside. Mm -hmm. It's just soft powder. Mm -hmm. And on the front side and the backside is just very fine talcum powder consistency dirt. But on the front side is Mostly it's more basalt, and on the back side, it's just normal planetary stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I tried to point out, the, 
we have not seen anything. Uh, now, some people say otherwise, but we have not seen anything in the pictures, and I know of nothing that indicates <coughs> our visitors have had bases on the moon. That isn't to say they don't or haven't, but there's nothing visible in any of the photographs or any of the observations that I have, that I'm aware of, that would cause us to believe had. that. Okay. Your, your, your colleagues had, of yeah. course. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I wondered if you know if there's any degree of truth to the rumor that's been floated the whole time that many of the astronauts have seen UFOs during their trips. Do you know if that's true or not? No. <clears throat> the, uh, there's quite a few of the astronauts in their <clears throat> military careers prior to being coming astronauts, like Gordon Cooper and Deke Slayton and a few others in their Air Force careers were vectored after a UFO or, tr or tried to chase one it's unsuccessfully because they always either disappeared or ran away. But <clears throat> up through the Apollo program and the Skylab program, which I was more intimately connected with, we, there were no confirmed UFO sightings in space. Now, we did see uh, things that turned out not to be abnormal at all. Uh, they were later identified as just debris, but, or they were happened to be maybe a, a spent rocket stage. But as far as UFOs, up through the uh, Skylab program, uh, the, the colleagues I have spoken with, uh, nothing uh, abnormal has been cited. I'd like to make one more uh, observation, and pretty much for everybody that's here. Um, the Army has a unit headquartered at the Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville, Alabama, called the Space Missile Defense Command. Step up, please. Space Missile Defense Command. Okay. Their shoulder patches read space fighters. If you call down there, they're very open, and they have a website, smdc.army.mil. And I was talking to an executive down there in the late 90s, and I said, oh, so you're the ones that are going to protect us from the ETs. Very matter-of-fact answer was, well, we think we can. So the idea that the government has suppressed this, hasn't acted on it, is totally wrong. The, the Reagan Stars War, Star Wars program actually means space fighting. And we have a military unit that's prepared for it. And it's dubious that <laughs> that organization exists uh, relative to topics that the government completely denies exist. I'm, um, <clears throat> I'm unfamiliar with that, although I was technical director for the Manned Orbiting Laboratory Program back in the early 60s when that first was initiated and then collapsed. But, and I'm quite well aware that there are other programs going on all the time, which I am not aware of by in any matter of detail. But thank you for your comments. smdc.army.mil. Thank you. I'm gonna jump in with occasional question. Uh, and this one is, is related to that a little bit, Edgar. Um, where are you, Steve? I'm Steve. I'm right here, right here uh, on the stage. I'm hiding here okay. in the corner here. Okay, gotcha. I'm sitting down so I don't fall and hurt myself. <laughs> um, you know, the whole SDI program, Space Defense Initiative, was extraordinarily controversial. Uh, uh, Carl Sagan got involved. A lot yes. of people didn't think it would work. We're that talking about, about platforms. And... There's a lot of reasonable speculation that the SDI wasn't just about, quote, uh, building weapons in space or uh, to, to help defend ourselves against the Soviet Union. I'm aware and of it, that, too. Uh, had, did you get any feedback along the ways from anyone uh, in the know that there was an extraterrestrial aspect to the SDI program? Uh, only vaguely. I did write a, uh, a manuscript, which I still have, called When Foxes Guard the Hen House, having to do with uh, weapons in space. And that manuscript I still have in my files, but to tell what the government thought of it, 34 publishers turned me down because I was b trying to blow the whistle on putting weapons in space, and it didn't. <clears throat> but uh, fortunately, it didn't go forward, but uh, uh, my, neither did my manuscript. <laughs> Well, I feel better because that makes me feel better about the fact that my manuscript was turned down by that many publishers. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, next question. 
Good morning, sir. Um, I have sort of a practical question and more of an esoteric question. I may not phrase it right, okay. so help me out. Go ahead. Um, we hear a lot right now about um, the fact that we really don't have a technology to physically get us off planet or to another I'm solar sorry, system. I'm not hearing you well. Your technology that what? We've, I've, I've read that we currently don't have the technology or capability to transport the human species out of the solar system or off the planet oh. far enough. Mm -hmm. So the first question is really practically based, what do we need to invent and build to get the, the human species to another ecosystem environment? But going along with that line of thought, uh, do you think that our essential humanness is contingent on living in these bodies? Or is there, would you foresee it some, you know, thousands of years later, uh, could we project some aspect of our consciousness into some other kind of a system or life form? And I think Michio Kaku's talked about, you know, you might have to make an uh, information stream and send it off through some alternate okay. transport. Let me address your questions in the order. First of all, I do think we'll probably be able to get outside of our solar system, and I've written a paper on that, by the end of this century. But we're going to have to bridge the gap between general relativity and quantum mechanics, and we haven't done that yet. We just, there's some real elusive answers there that are, it's not clear how we're going to do it. But <clears throat> it is clear that the aliens have done it, and uh, how they've done it through wormholes or what other device they call them, uh, I mean, that's... An, concept within general relativity. I'm not sure that's the right concept, but nevertheless, that is the area of breakthrough that we have to, we have, to have before we can get there. The second question has to do with the nature of consciousness itself, and we have not uh, really resolved that problem either. And of course, there are multi-dimensional theories which uh, have not, are not well formed, and it appears that string theory, brain theory, M theory, which are attempts at multidimensional theories, are kind of falling apart on us right now. They're not really substantial theories and not holding water. But the, uh, the, the work at the LHC, in, due to resume this year in Switzerland, may help us shed some brand new light on that. <clears throat> However, the issue of consciousness is one that's still out. <clears throat> One of my early uh, investors and board persons with Institute of Nordic Sciences was John Fetzer. I don't know how many know that name, but uh, John owned, uh, owned uh, t television stations in the uh, Michigan area and b more broadly, and the, uh, let's see, was it the Detroit the baseball team and a few other things. He's a wealthy philanthropist. And he was on my board, and he said, Edgar, I would like, in your studies of consciousness, the first issue is, uh, does consciousness survive death? And I said to him, John, I would love to research that, but I've got to first find out what consciousness is, because we really don't know. And uh, you know, for you folks here, as I have often outlined or framed the issue <clears throat> of the two extremes, the idealist extreme on one hand, that says all is consciousness, and the extreme point of view is that matter is not really matter, it's, it's just a thought in the universal mind. That's the extreme of idealism, which goes back to, to Platonic times. And then on the other extreme is uh, scientific materialism uh, and reductionism <clears throat> that says consciousness is only an epiphenomenon of the collision of, random collision of matter, it's an accident in nature. Well, I don't believe any one of those, either one of those two extremes is correct, that the truth somewhere is in between. And that's what we've been looking for for 35 years, and we're narrowing down. But we still don't have the answer, and nor do we have any definitive experiments in science that we can test, because science is about postulating and finding experimental evidence to validate your postulate. So somewhere in between those two extremes, we're sure there's an answer to this question, what is consciousness? But we still haven't gotten there yet. That is one of the great enigmas, and I'm sure that it is a part of this intersection between general relativity and quantum mechanics that help us understand that. But that's one of the enigmas we're still wrestling with. 
and it's, it's one of the tough ones. And as we, if we resolve that in a proper way over the next decades or so, uh, then I'm sure by the end of this century, uh, we'll be able to go outside of the, this solar system that we're in. But also I can say in a hopeful way, I think we're narrowing in and getting pretty close to the concept of beam me up, Scotty. We're not too far away from that. And that'll help us understand this issue very much better. Oh, one more question. Are you looking into, or do you know anyone who's looking into um, interaction of nanotechnology with perception and consciousness? With perception? And, and oh, consciousness. Oh, absolutely. That's fundamental. The whole notion of perception. And uh, let, just let me very briefly, I don't want to go on this at length, but the work in quantum holography that my colleague Walter Schimp in Germany discovered almost about 14 years ago now, and we've been working on that, that uh, in studying MRI machines, he, he essentially invented functional MRI by discovering <clears throat> this quantum hologram. And uh, a non-local quantum, uh, quantum mechanical concept of <clears throat> a best way to explain it is that we consider in the English language intuition, we call it our sixth sense. And since we now know it's, it's based in quantum holography or quantum properties, it should be called our first sense because it was around long before our solar system and we were around. It is a basic informational structure in nature associated with perception. And we now can understand and demonstrate very clearly that all of our sensory mechanisms are fundamentally tied in to this non-local quantum property. Now that's a, that's a long dissertation to talk about that, but we now are quite confident that that's true. And that will help lead us to understanding the sensory mechanism and hopefully consciousness and perception in the not too distant future. The whole idea, and I'll give you the most basic clue, the whole idea, quantum mechanics is based upon entangled particles. That if particles are ever entangled, and they go apart from each other, they maintain quantum correlation. If we describe quantum correlation as the most fundamental aspect of awareness in nature, then and build on top of that, we're getting a pretty good picture of what awareness, perception, and consciousness is all about. Next one, go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. Dr. Mitchell, I was wondering what exact parts of the Roswell crash story were confirmed for you at the level of the Pentagon or the Joint Chiefs of Staff? I'm sorry, repeat, you, repeat that, please. What exact parts of the Roswell crash story were confirmed for you at the level of the Pentagon or, jo or Joint Chiefs of Staff? Or and the, ha how are they confirmed? Well, <clears throat> the only thing that was presented was that the Roswell crash was a real phenomenon as opposed to the myriad stories that have been promulgated since then. Let's put it this way. If the Roswell crash were, were something like a, a balloon or any of the other half a dozen stories that have been promulgated over the last 60 years, uh, that's one thing. But if it were really what it is, why do you need all these other stories that have been changed over the last 60 years, one after the other, over a period of a large number of years. But, and when the people involved, including uh, Jesse Marcel, uh, a number of those others who, and, and Jesse Marcel Jr. has spoken at this conference and had pieces brought to him and saw them as a kid, and uh, other people have described it. I mean, what, do you, what more do you want? Now, is that evidence that we have right now? No. but. Uh, these, are, these are trustworthy, believable people, and certainly the lore in the, around the Roswell area was ubiquitous and of the same story. The only issue was, was the Roswell crash something local or was it something alien? And the concept was it was alien, including the bodies that were recovered and uh, taken away from the site. And was, were the efforts such as uh, uh, efforts at retroengineering that have been reported uh, uh, confirmed to you through your sources? Well, most, well I, can't, I cannot speak with authority <clears throat> to how much back engineering has really taken place 
although in the lore, some has, and I would not be surprised to find that some of the current unknown objects or UFO objects are homegrown, but I don't know that for sure, and I can't say one, of the, some, one way or the other with certainty. Were, uh, another question, were, were you briefed on the UFO phenomena, briefed on the, were you briefed on the UFO phenomena during your astronaut training? No, not at all. It was never even touched upon in the NASA I was with. Lastly, I would suggest that uh, your, your man, manuscript on the weaponization of space, if you can't find a publisher, perhaps you should just put it on the internet and you don't need a publisher. That is true. At that time, we didn't have an internet when I wrote that. <laughs> the internet was subsequent to that. But we may get it done yet. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, it's, it seems to me that space is one of the big frontiers for exploration, but another one is uh, the deep sea. Is that please? The oceans. Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, I mean, I imagine I, I've seen the photographs of the, uh, of the Earth, you know, from, from space, and it it's mostly water, and uh, during uh, Dr. Greer's disclosure uh, event, one of the witnesses, I think it was w Dan Willis, uh, gave testimony from the Navy that something was under the sea that came through the surface and went past a ship. So <clears throat> being with the Navy and having the uh, access uh, that you've got, uh, could you speculate or do you uh, have any opinions about uh, what may be under the seas? Well, I am aware of the stories and the lore just as you are but I have no more definitive proof of that than anything else. But uh, yes, there are stories such as that. that uh, and one of the, that's one of what we're trying to do now, I guess, is to get this all really opened up so we can sort facts from fiction and lore and stories, misinformation, disinformation, and what's really going on. And that's what this effort's really all about right now. Okay, I'm gonna jump in with a question here, uh, Doctor. Um, uh, straightforward question. Did you have the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with Neil Armstrong? And uh, whether or not you did or not, do you have some sense of why this gentleman, who at one time was the most famous human being in the world, why he has chosen such a reclusive, uh, a very private reclusive life since, of course, his extraordinary uh, uh, walk? Well, I did. We all had a, at least a reasonable personal relationship with Neil. He was a buddy, he was a colleague, uh, but he is also a very reclusive man. And the story is, and I don't know whether it's really true, but in the post-flight travels that he and Buzz did, and we all did our post-flight travels, and they, they had a little bit more of it, being the first team to uh, go out than, uh, than some of the others of us. But there is a story that in a, a large crowd in India. Uh, he was speaking to several thousands of people in an open air stadium. And uh, at the end of it, there was a surge forward of the crowd toward him. And uh, it shook him up so badly, he's been reticent ever since. Now, I don't know whether that's a complete story or not. Or, but Neil is a rather private, quiet guy and has chosen not to work in the public sector or rather in a visual, visible sector of uh, this work as, as much as some of the rest of us, but maybe he has good reason to. He would be so overwhelmed by it that uh, it wasn't comfortable for him, but he has been quite quiet about it. Do you ever have any regrets that maybe you didn't take Neil's course? No, I, but I do a pretty good job. I, I live a quiet, very quiet life when I'm home, and uh, I don't involve myself too much in local activities simply because I need my privacy and I need my space when I go home from these travels. Next question. Into the mic, please. Thank you, Steve. Dr. Mitchell, uh, sir, your outstanding career achievements serve as such a wonderful example of the tremendous accomplishments of our American citizens and outstanding nation. Do you think it appropriate at this time, sir, that our nation take the lead in open, transparent discussion and full exploration of the tremendous opportunities presented by the extraterrestrial presence. Thank you. The answer is absolutely yes, and that's why we're here. It's to hope, help open this up 
and hopefully that uh, we will be more successful in doing that here in the next decade than we haven't been in the, in the past decade. It's, in my opinion, vital that we begin to take our position, our place, and let's call it a community of planets just like we would a, a small community on this earth when we're isolated without transportation on foot and all of that. Then when we developed uh, uh, locomotion and vehicles to get around, we started forming into communities. Well, we've got the same thing on the larger scale of a planet right now. And that to me is the challenge of the 21st century is how do we actualize this and make it work because uh, as a community we can learn from others and we can learn to survive as a species but we do have a problem of survival for this species. Go ahead sir. First of all Dr. Mitchell thank you uh, for your service to our nation and our military. I want you to know you're a true hero of mine. My grandfather and my dad both fought in two world wars and I didn't have to largely because of the service of people like you. And I think on behalf of everyone here, I want to express our gratitude for that. Thank you. There were, I'm sure there are many of us in this room who have served our time in the military. Secondly, I think you may be the last living witness to one of the greatest historical events on the planet. I think you were certainly the youngest at the time. If I remember from your biography, you uh, by chance saw the Trinity uh, test site explosion. Is that correct? Uh, you mean at White Sands? Is that the word? Yeah. Were, were you out delivering papers that morning? Is that what I remember? We'd, right. Uh, at that period in time, of course, that was about this, just a little before the so-called Roswell incident. Uh, but we, we could see from the flash. I lived in Artesia, which was right down the road from Roswell. And uh, you, we were alerted, and we did see the flash, of the atomic flash across the mountains uh, to the uh, to the west of us, about 150 miles or so, it was that bright across the mountains. And I, I was understood later that that's exactly what the flash was that we were talking about, because the early tests were there. And I have the sneaky suspicion, and it's not so sneaky, the suspicion that the whole ET interest and the reason for the Roswell crash, well, we have quite a bit of evidence since that time that uh, the UFO phenomenon is prevalent around nuclear sites and nuclear tests. And since uh, Roswell was the first uh, a strategic, wep a strategic aviation squadron carrying nuclear weapons, and White Sand was right across the mountains from us, I suspect, uh, at least a lore would have it, that that was a part of the interest of the, the alien investigation. I think you must have been one of the youngest witnesses to that uh, test site. Uh, first nuclear explosion. Well, the, whole, the whole community there was, uh, yeah. That was so just a they alerted you to, to, that, that something was going to happen that morning? Such that you, they alerted the community that something would be happening? So I can't were, remember now. It's been so long. I, I just happened to know that uh, I happened to be up. And maybe I was going to the ranch with my father very early in the morning when that happened. I just can't recall all of that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, I just noticed this gentleman from the back here. Uh, any chance that you would commit to the audience today that if, in fact, you have a chance to go back into space, <laughs> that you would wear an ex-conference t-shirt? <laughs> well, I'll have to think about that one. Uh, I don't know whether that's adequate protection from the rigors of space or not. <laughs> uh, Dr. Mitchell, I have several questions. Uh, firstly, the uh, 1997 incident you mentioned concerning an admiral that was denied access to uh, Roswell-related information projects. Uh, do you have any knowledge of who it was that denied him access and whether it's true that it was actually a defense or lawyers or attorneys for a defense contract? From Admiral Wilson, no, I do not know who that was. Okay. Uh, second question, have you ever uh, had any information passed on to you by any witness concerning photos of President Eisenhower meeting with extraterrestrials or any treaty signed? I'm sorry, start that one have, again. Have you been ev ever given any information by any witness concerning photos of President Eisenhower meeting with extraterrestrials and of any treaty signed by the U.S. <coughs> with extraterrestrials? I have heard that in the lore. I have no hard evidence, nor have I seen any documentation, but I have heard it at this conference and uh, through some, some of the other contacts, perhaps yourself, I don't know. 
And finally, um, with the uh, Roswell crash, did you ever uh, get any information that what may have brought down the, uh, the UFO was a new type of radar that was designed for tracking captured V-2 rockets from White Sands? <clears throat> no, I have not heard that. I don't think that is true because the area of the crash was, uh, uh, would not been, I don't believe, amenable to that to that uh, phenomenon, being isolated as it was northwest of Roswell mm -hmm. and quite a ways from the White Sands. And uh, um, so I, I can't really speak to that with authority, but it doesn't seem reasonable to me. Thank you. Okay. I would first like to say it's an honor um, to be able to ask you questions and everything. Okay. And because it's such an honor, um, or it is such an honor because of all of your experience that you've had. And because of all of your experience, I wonder what, um, how you view President Barack Obama and if you feel that he's the right person right now to get us on the path um, that you believe will help <laughs> us evolve as a people. Well, in answer to your question, I certainly hope so. But none of us can actually guarantee what any president's gonna do but clearly he is moving in a direction opposite from the past, or at least in a different direction in the past, and the direction in the past was not very hopeful. Uh, this at least has, gives us hope that we can move in a better direction and must. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna jump in with a question here real quickly. Uh, a fairly significant event did occur in 2004, uh, and I've dealt with it quite a bit. And that, of course, was when Governor Bill Richardson of New Mexico was asked to write a foreword for the book Roswell Dig Diaries, which was about a project that was funded by the Sci-Fi Channel, which also created the Coalition for the Freedom of Information that is lobbying for the issue in Washington. And in that, ex in that foreword, Bill Richardson, who I know is planning to run for president and also a very likely vice presidential pick, actually wrote in words that can never be taken back, that he, he felt that the explanations given by the, uh, the government, the Air Force, simply did not hold up. He felt that we really needed to get the information out and that the people had a right to know. Did you, have you ever interacted with him? Have you talked to him since? Uh, have any sense of, of why he did that? <clears throat> no, I, I do know him vaguely. I do not know him intimately or personally. And no, I do not know, except for the fact that <clears throat> In New Mexico, this has become, even more so than the rest of the country, uh, started to become a hot type topic because, uh, you know, Jack Schmidt, astronaut of Apollo 17, uh, grew up in the New Mexico area, as I did, and, and uh, until recently did have a home there, and was a senator from New Mexico. So that, that all fits into this mix here, but I can't answer your question any more directly than that. Um, hi, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, two different questions for you. Uh, number one, would you be able or willing to go on a major TV show like Larry King or Charlie Rose and relate the story that you told us this morning about <clears throat> you telling the Pentagon that the Roswell's, your version of the Roswell story and them relating that it was true well, I have uh, told that story, and uh, I have been asked by CNN for an interview, and now exactly who and what that, where that would be shown, I don't know. But I'm not adverse to that, but it has not opened, an opportunity okay. opened up for it at the moment. And just two other quick things. Um, I've read a lot that the NASA space program that we see publicly is just a small part of a much larger program and I didn't know if you could talk about that. I'm and sorry, that fine? That the NASA program that the average American citizen knows about is actually a small part of a much larger space program. I was well, wondering if you could talk about that. And No, but I don't know about that. Okay. There may be other things, but I don't think it's necessarily within NASA. Uh, NASA is very much, the program is very much open at the moment as far as I know. And uh, I, at the moment, it seemed pretty ineffectual to me. But uh, hopefully, with new administration, new direction, uh, <clears throat> we can carry out this idea of uh, being the first generation of spacefarers off of Earth mm -hmm. and move it forward. 
at the moment I don't find the program terribly effective, even though, yes, there's on paper at least plans to go back to the moon, plans to go on to Mars in due course, but I quite often say in my talks <coughs> that when we go to Mars, and we will in due course, provided we don't blow ourselves up with stupidities first, and we look back from Mars at this tiny little planet we call Earth, it will sound kind of foolish to say I came from the United States, Canada, England, Russia, Germany, Israel, or where, no, came from Earth. And we're not ready to do that yet. We haven't got our act together. And uh, we're not ready to be spacefarers. And uh, Kennedy pulled a decade out of the 21st century in the 20th century during the contest, the space race, initial space race with the Soviets in order to get us into space first. But we jumped so far ahead that the public hadn't caught up with it yet. And we got to be a spacefaring civilization. So that means we have to change our minds about it. And perhaps this whole issue right now that we're f facing with the uh, alien visitation, with the problems of sustainability, maybe this is the turning point. Let's hope so. And, and finally, you wrote about having a profound spiritual experience in space. I was wondering if you could, if you're able to convey that, what that was like. <clears throat> well, very, very, very briefly. I won't take a lot of our time on it. Very, very briefly. <clears throat> it's a phenomenon that has happened in all cultures at all times. And it has, uh, uh, various names in different cultures. Out of the Greek, it's called metanoia, change of heart, change of mind. And the Zen tradition is called satori. In the uh, ancient Hindi tradition, it's called, uh, <coughs> in the uh, Sanskrit, written in Sanskrit, it's called samadhi. It's the idea of a change of perspective and it causes you to see and experience the unity of all life, the oneness of all life. And the ancients described that because, and my own experience, investigating cultures all over the world in their deep lore, their ancient lore. There's a history of this, but it's, and it is indeed the basis of religion, that, uh, but a cultural religion. And the, the mystics, the uh, great leaders who had these types of experiences, they told it, and a religion formed around it, but it's a culture. It's a culture, cultural explanation. And, and now at this point in time, we fight over whose religion is the best one, but it's all, in my opinion, they're all rooted in the same transcendent, transformational type of phenomena. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to jump in, and again, I'm going to clarify a little bit for the gentleman's first question, Edgar. Um, as you know, uh, you were on a Larry King show a while ago, it was a number of months ago, but you were part of a number of guests. It was quite That's a right. few up there, it's like eight or nine. Um, and since then, you and I have suggested to the, the, the producer of Larry King, Avril Gallagher, that you and I would come on to do a show, or that you would come on alone to do a show, the fundamental theme being the disclosure dilemma. Mm -hmm. And we heard back from Avril, who said that, well, they weren't quite ready to do another show right. on that at this time, all right? Uh, which, I, okay, fine. I mean, that they can do the shows they want to do. But I, I'd like to point out to the audience that uh, Larry King Show and all of the programs have their websites and they have the contact page on there. And they invite people to email them with their suggestions for guests, for shows. And I have a hunch that if everyone in this audience and then through their Facebook <laughs> and through their mail list were to get on it and go, you know, let's get a request in to Larry King Show, which is a very, very important show, believe me, that we want Edgar Mitchell on there by himself, right? for a lengthy interview to get into these things, I have a chance, I th thought we we'd, uh, might see you on. Now, the other thing I'll add is this. You, uh, CNN International called last night, and they wanted you to be on television with them at 4 p.m. this evening. As you know, I told you. We have agreed that I'm going to call them and, 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 and point out that, that we can't do that, because if he goes on tonight, he's scooping the press tomorrow at the press conference, and I think that's inappropriate. And so we will suggest to them that, okay, can we go on tomorrow night? So we'll see what happens there. And the other thing I'll mention is, is that Edgar got hu several hundred interview requests of various types after the Kerrang uh, interview right. in the UK. He was not able to respond to the majority of those. And then the news cycle ended. Uh, but now we're hoping to start a new news cycle. And with any luck, they'll be back. 
And I, I know that Edgar is going to try to do as many as possible. So I hope you're just turning on your TV here in the next few weeks and month, and you just can't get away from him. He just keeps turning up everywhere. <laughs> All right, next question. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. Um, for a couple of clarifications. One, your spacewalk where you had your transformational experience well, was that, during. That, that was coming back home after the flight. Frank. That was after that. Yeah. Was that, was that, uh, but you, did you make a spacewalk were you in, in Gemini? Were well, not you? a spacewalk, but, mm -hmm. no, not in Gemini. Um, only in the Apollo program and the Apollo program on the moon. But I, I was back up on other flights, yes. but my only flight was the Apollo. But Lander. which flight was it that you had your transformational experience? Well, that was described. returning from Apollo 14. Returning from, from Apollo. From the, okay. Yeah, after my work was done on the surface, okay. and I had time to relax and kind of look out the window, and be a tourist, yes. and look at the heavens pass by as we rotated. See, we were rotating to keep thermal balance on the spacecraft. Yes. So that allowed the Earth, the Moon, the Sun, and a 360-degree panorama of the stars to appear in the spacecraft window every two minutes. That's a pretty wild experience. Well, all of us here, us Earthlings, can only dream of something <laughs> like that. The, uh, may I ask you, uh, were you raised in a faith? In a, were you raised in a traditional faith of any sort when you grew up? Were you in a religion? Oh, yes, I, I grew up as, in a, as a Baptist. My, my mother was, and grandmother were uh, rather ardent in their religion. Okay, and if, if Steve's fondest wish comes true and you make news tomorrow, the second question that reporters will ask you is something like, do you yourself have any firsthand knowledge about Roswell or the other high profile uh, crashes that have been part of the lore here for years, uh, other than what folks at these conferences might be exposed to? No, my answer is I have no first-hand experience, but I'm very, very familiar and have read most of the books of, of the investigators, that many of whom are at this conference, over the years, and I did become quite interested in it after my space flight when the, what I call the old-timers came to me with their stories, and so I have followed the law, although it, uh, UFO phenomenon and aliens have not been my primary area of investigation, but I am re quite knowledgeable in what the fine research people who have done over the last several decades have produced uh, in the way of literature for this. And talk so to many let's, of them, of course, personally. So let's be clear. You are persuaded that we are in we are being visited or interacted with Utterly by extraterrestrials Utterly and completely. Routinely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, it's not, not the least of which is that John Mack was a very close friend and colleague before he passed on. And he and I had, had uh, we were at a private conference together set up by one of my board members at Noetics investigating how do we, are talking about how do we proceed with all of this. So I knew John's work quite well. And even though he did not, in his lifetime, pass on the veracity of what his patients or his subject of his investigation, he did pass on the fact these were good, solid people, not crackpots, that were telling their stories of abduction and uh, interaction with the alien presence. Yes, sir. I, I was involved with, with uh, the first program that funded John's work. Okay. It, so and so you know I, how sincere he yes, was. Yes, and I knew work. him, and uh, we all miss him. Uh, final thing, and not to inject negativity or darkness, but the question is, in the field of ufology, as it's called, there are always controversies within controversies. That's correct. And sort of, Brett, there's two questions. One, if it's real, it has a politics when That's you right. deal with the interactions. And so once you get past the is it real question where you are, then you're looking at intentionality, at what is happening, what influences, and if there's more than one, there's a political dimension. Yep. Can you speak to that at all? Uh, no, I can't within the, um, in the, in the power. All I can say is I know the lore. I know the various factions. I know what's going on. 
I know that the disinformation and misinformation has been deliberate and the notion of keeping the field muddy and closed has been a, a <clears throat> prime objective of some and opening it up has been a prime objective of others. And uh, uh, hopefully the opening it up is gonna succeed here. The um, also part of the uh, philosophical paranoia that is endemic to this is the question of they with capital T. The question I have is when you say disinformation and whatever, and you, you inter I interviewed you last year and you gave me your opinion, which I won't share here about uh, the whole Mars thing, the Mars culture thing of Richard Hoagland and others. But how do you think those kind of disputes over catechism impact the larger transformational issue culturally that you are advocating by the acknowledgement of the ET involvement and presence on Earth? Well, I think that's just our human uh, propensity is to have uh, our own points of view and to espouse those points of view. I will illustrate it <clears throat> by the uh, issue of some, Bart Seibrell to name one, who had been prominent in the notion we never went to the moon. And uh, uh, that man with false credentials, of press credentials, found his way into my home, and after five minutes of listening to him start his questions, I immediately realized who he was, booted him in Fanny and threw him out of my house. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he encountered Buzz Aldrin on the streets of Los Angeles the following week who poked him in the nose. <laughs> and the whole point of that was we humans do that. Whether we want 15 minutes of fame or whatever it is we're after, trying to propagate our own point of view, and there's almost as many points of view as there are humans to do it. You so that is a part of our problem as scientists because I consider science the ultimate truth finder in our modern world. We do it through uh, 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 postulating and then finding experiments that will validate our postulate and then finding anomalies to the experiment to have to repostulate again. That's what we're all about. And so I don't find that any, um, I don't find that anomalous itself. That's the way we operate. And that includes the politics. That includes the fact that science and scientists uh, come up with different theories and different approaches, and we have to progress uh, slowly but surely through uh, unwinding all of this uh, as we go forward. And we're at a very crucial time, I think, in human history right now. But it's been going on like this forever. Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, Follow-up clarification, uh, Dr. Mitchell. Uh, let me be sure, because I, I know, know your point on this. Some of the people that have come to you, the old guard and everything else, and you've talked to, let's be clear, that have given you very strong, you feel, confirmatory persuasion. Some of these people are of high rank and station within government and military, am I not right? They have been, yes. All right, thank you. Dr. Mitchell, uh, I want to uh, preface my question with a, a remark. I think uh, no one in this room will disagree with me uh, and the fact that you're probably one of the most knowledgeable, respected individuals in the world. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, that being said, I could uh, probably stand up here for uh, hours and hours and hours and ask you questions that are burning in my mind. So I thought, well, what's the one thing I could ask him uh, that would be uh, perhaps interesting to the audience if you knew the answer. And uh, so I, I became very selfish and I thought to myself, well, my gosh, there's something I'd really like to know on something that was very specific. And I followed the, uh, the space program since its uh, inception, uh, sitting there for hours uh, watching things happen on television and listening to the news. And I remember an incident uh, during one of the Apollo missions uh, that was announced uh, on both radio and TV and then just uh, faded away with absolutely no answer and no publicity given to it. 
there was an announcement made that uh, during uh, one instance of the program, uh, the public was told that there was a locking mechanism that had been installed on the Apollo capsule. And I just wondered if you, uh, this was on the inside, not on the outside. And I wondered if you had any knowledge of that whatsoever. I do, I do not know what you're referring to, frankly. Uh, could you be a little more specific about what, what do you mean a locking mechanism? I don't know. S something that uh, would lock the, uh, the entrance and exit to the uh, capsule uh, from the inside. I mean, when you do that, there's implications that you don't want somebody to open the door from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> I know of, of no, no such thing. However, uh, <clears throat> except for the main cabin entrance, which was modified after the fire uh, of Apollo 1, so-called, uh, you can't, you, you can't do it any other way. You, you've got full control on inside. You have to do some stuff on the inside to remove hatches to get out of, the, out of it. There's no way to really to get in. There's no door, as you're talking, no locking mechanism uh, like you're describing that I'm a, never has been, to my knowledge. Well, then that uh, satisfies me as to the answer to the question, yeah. <laughs> because that was probably something in the news that uh, somebody saw or uh, uh, made up. It sounds that, like imagination of... Uh, somebody thinking there might be a need to uh, keep somebody from getting in. However, the only time we would really need somebody to get in was like in the case of the Apollo 1 fire, when uh, they couldn't get in to help them quickly enough. Well, thank you very much. Thank I appreciate you. that. You bet. And that whole idea of putting screen doors in the capsules, that, that never, that never <laughs> got <laughs> off never the ground. Happened, no. Good morning. Um, Good morning. While I was standing there, I thought of a second question, which is, what is your thoughts on what is the alien agenda? Because one of the speakers the first day, all he said about it was that he couldn't talk about it because he got followed when he got talking about it. Let me ask you my first question, which was, you, you said today that the research, I guess, that you're doing is that the Big Bang Theory will... Uh, fade away as an explanation. Could you explain more about that? Well, I think we have, first, I think we have a theoretical mechanism at this point to show how matter can arise from the quantum fluctuations of the zero point energy field. Now that has to be validated, but the mathematical formalism associated with the quantum hologram seems sufficient to be a candidate for precisely that process. And I would suspect, now this is, my own, this is my own speculation, that the dark energy and dark matter that is now being observed, I think it's very likely proto-matter that's coming into being. And when we get better understanding of what is happening in deep space, and you know, the, the magnificent new photographs we've got from Hubble, and we're seeing further uh, of, further afield than we ever had before with a great deal more mystery. But this notion of dark energy and dark matter is a real modern issue. And my speculation is that's probably what we're seeing starting to happen is matter coming into being. And uh, <clears throat> see, there's so many problems in my opinion with the Big Bang. Okay, how did it get there in the first place? What caused all of this? And uh, if it's far, more, uh, it's far more sane to me to realize that nature is such that, that whatever is going on is going on continuously. And what the, <clears throat> I, I will th throw a technical term at you, those of you who may be mathematically inclined, it's called Dirac Heisenberg Neopotent Lie Group Algebra, <laughs> if you want to hang on to that, is uh, the mathematical formalism that suggests to us that the quantum fluctuations in deep space and the zero point field are sufficient to allow matter to arise ex nihilo from those quantum fluctuations. Maybe, maybe not. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, uh, I'm jump in. Because of our difficulties earlier, we are going to run long, and it's now 20 up. We're going to go about 10 more minutes. So if you, we have 10 minutes to get those questions in. I'm going to, I have a question here kind of related to what he just said. Um, do you, do you have any fundamental problem, either intellectually or emotionally, with the idea 
of infinity. And what I mean by that... Of what, please? Of infinity. In okay. other words, we all have this sense of, of beginnings and ends. You know, the, 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 the room starts here and ends there. Our life begins and ends and so forth. But in terms of the big picture, do you have a problem with the idea of infinite time and infinite space? No, I do not. I do not. Um, so during the discussion, the idea of unification of, and qu of quantum mechanics and Einstein's field equations has been brought up, and um, the gentleman just kind of brought the subject matter to the front again. Um, in the Journal of Noetic Sciences, there was a unified field theory presented by uh, Dr. E.A. Rauscher and Nassim Haramein. Um, so I was wondering what gravity you, you give to that theory, and more generally, um, what do you think it would take? You've said that we're not there yet, but what do you think it would take to bring these types of de ideas well, to the mainstream? Well, I think we've got the whole area of frontier science. <clears throat> First of all, let's say that conscious, that science cannot be complete until we understand consciousness, why we are conscious, how consciousness exists in the universe, how it, where it came from, what all of its manifestations are, and the fact, you see, what, what's vital here is we very adequately demonstrated that mind influences matter. We can create effects in matter. Geller's spoon bending, for one thing, that, that kids can do. And healing through intentionality, which I've experienced and others have experienced. These are still great mysteries, and not as much as they were 30 years ago, but they are still mysteries since, I, since we can't write a coherent equation in science to, to illustrate or to manage these ideas. So we have a long ways to go, and uh, that to me is what the future is all about. That's what noetics is all about. That is what my new organization called Quantrek is all about, is to take what we do know, particularly the mathematics and the physics and the biology that's opening up due to these new discoveries and push them just as far as we can to get the type of answers that we don't have right now. Thank you. And, and also, I, I, I want to mention, folks, uh, please consider checking out the uh, Institute of Noetic Science website, IONS website, and think about joining. Think about getting involved there. And there's also a Friends of IONS group out there. I know that Edgar would love to have many of you uh, join up in, in that wonderful project. Next question. By the way, just in response to Steve, <clears throat> yes, Noetics is reshaping its agenda right now. Marilyn Schlitz is our new president who has been our director of research for 17 years, vice president for research. <clears throat> and we are reshaping our agenda, uh, much more aligned to scientific investigation and reshaping our our programs, uh, membership programs. So take a look at uh, noetic.org and uh, see what you think about it and we'd welcome you. Go ahead, sir. Uh, two, two questions. Um, NASA had a few documents on their website related to UFOs and a few years ago those were removed and which haven't... Which website are you talking about? Um, I'm, I don't remember exactly which which branch of the NASA website it was on, but there were, there were several documents related to their position on UFOs. You're and about NASA? NASA. I'm not aware of that, yeah. but go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I was just wondering if you had any idea what happened, or if they, or they're changing their position. Um, this, my second uh, question is, why do you think we stopped going to the moon? <clears throat> well, the first, the first question, I'm not aware of it at all. The second question is because the public wasn't supporting it, because the political wind shifted. And uh, <clears throat> uh, as I said earlier, John Kennedy, when we went to the moon, plucked 10 years out of the 21st century and pulled it back to the 20th century, and we went to the moon. But the public interest and desire has not been maintained. The, presumably, we do things according to public interest in this country. And uh, that going to the moon and going into space kind of fell from uh, number one priority, which it was at that time. Uh, just really quickly, too, um, what do you think about other countries starting to go into space? I think it's natural. And I think uh, when we, <clears throat> as I said earlier, when we do really get serious as a planetary civilization about going into space, it's going to take all of us doing it because it's, it's too expensive for any one nation, even a rich nation, or used to be a rich nation like our own. 
Uh, <clears throat> but to me, it, we must go as a civilization, and we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you teach children. <clears throat> I'm a mother of two small children, and I'm, can you hear me? I'm uh, new to the area, and there's so much information, it's overwhelming, but I want to teach my children. I don't want to scare them like the U.S. government. Right. I don't want to panic them. Right. Um, so I was wondering if you had an opinion or if you could share how you deal with the subject with children, or if you don't, and just put that aside and teach consciousness Well, to I, them. I think the way to... Um, now, this is a simplistic answer. The way to approach this subject begins with the fact of, of exciting them about discovery and new ideas because it's all happening very fast and children are very open to that. <clears throat> and the so-called paranormal, which, uh, which I, by the way, paranormal is not the right word, it's very normal. Uh, nothing para about it. <clears throat> but the children, have all of these capabilities and we have suppressed them, we parents have suppressed them in our raising children because <clears throat> as a matter of fact just to illustrate my point to you when Uri Geller was I was first working with him 30 some years ago here in this country and we were on television major television station he's doing his thing bending spoons and bending, fixing clocks and all these sorts of things that he does <clears throat> and children were seeing it. I was getting calls from mamas uh, all over the place, but I was responding to those in local areas that I could get to. They're saying, please help me, Johnny. My little Johnny's bending spoons. He saw Uri Geller on television. <laughs> and so I would take a spoon or a couple of spoons and go to mama's residence and sit down with little Johnny and I'd say, okay, Johnny, show me what you can do. And I would hold a spoon and he'd rub it like Uri Geller and the darn thing would twist up <clears throat> like Geller did it. So we know that kids, we all have these capabilities, and some in greater measure, like great athletes, great artists, great mathematicians, we all have our talents, and some in greater measure than others. But these are talents you see that science, and <clears throat> well, they burn witches at the stake for centuries for doing things like this. Hopefully we're past that, but we're now understanding these are normal human capabilities, and that mind-matter interactions are perfectly normal thing. And mind over matter interactions are perfectly normal things. And we have demonstrated there in the quantum world because you can't screen them out with electromagnetic magnetic screening, Faraday cage screening. Uh, but you can screen out television, radio, and all these sorts of things. But you can't screen out gravitation or these types of effects. So we know we're dealing with a quantum level phenomenon. And the more we research and open this up, the more normal it becomes, the easier it will be for our children to grasp and their natural talents and capabilities, and we can help them develop these in a proper, sane way as we grow up. And I know <clears throat> my children, and I have both adopted children and bio children, what I tried to teach them in my life was put more back into the system than you take out. And they've all done that, so I'm very proud of them. That, that was my major task, I thought, as a parent, was to teach them to live sanely, honestly, and to put more in the system than they took out. And I can say it worked. And uh, I recommend that. Do you have one book that you could recommend I start with? Thank you. I'm sorry, your question again? Do you have one book that you recommend to start with on that type of guiding well, children? A book. Do you have a book you can recommend? No, I, I really don't. There's an awful, awful lot of good ones out there. Thank All right. You. All right, folks, we have five, five minutes. That's it. Three very quick, tight questions. Okay. It's the last three. Okay. I have two questions. Um, when you're talking about the dyad in energy and matter, mm -hmm. uh, do you ever consider a triad What's of the something, What's the third a, an of additional the category? Um, how do you relate, um, you have the EMC square and the Einstein field theory. Uh, do you also work with the, um, which works with the curvature of time? Do you also work with the spin factors and how does that relate to the electromagnetic field that you were talking about? Well, <clears throat> first of all, uh, there are quite a few effects here that mm -hmm. need investigating and spin and uh, torsion fields are vital to that. However, 
uh, I do challenge some of the general relativistic notions like curvature of space mm -hmm. and time. Uh, space is pretty empty. Have you, do you know how to curve something that's empty, something that's nothing, that's of that substance? I mean, you can't curve air. Okay, it can blow around buildings, but it doesn't naturally have a curve. And so we now can explain, for example, light bending around planets mm -hmm. because that the field around the planet has a characteristic uh, that refracts light, as, as opposed to the old notion that somehow space is curved around planets. And to me, that's no longer a valid notion. However, it's academic, still academically acceptable. But how does that work then if we have geometries that work with like a double um, tube torus type geometrical configuration that would maybe give us four instead of the two? Um, well, resolving these types of anomalies, and that's what science is about. You postulate, you do experiments to prove your postulate, and then you start to find anomalies that don't fit those experiments. And that's what science is about. We proceed through anomalous, through anomalies. And the, there is a society called the Society for uh, Scientific Exploration that is devoted precisely to that phenomenon, the anomalies that are now existing in our, in our theoretical structures. And they're all over the place. Right. And that's what we have to handle. So you see the double tube torus concept, um, the double tube torus and the geometrics that would would create that because we see it in the galaxies as, uh, and the nebulas as well as possibly in our planet that, that explains or ties in with the black hole and, and uh, again yeah. um, energy either turning into matter or new things being formed. Well I think what you're raising is some very very complex issues that are a little too complex for, know, for this but, venue. Yeah, but, I think, I think okay, so. The, uh, but but we're uh, not, not a good time I just to get wanted, into advanced I just physics. wanted to see if if you know you were working on that or where I could yeah, go, the answer that is yes. We have there are and is people there a particular website that I could go to? No, I can't answer that. Uh, okay, uh, that you will find the answer to what you're asking. But our Quantrek website, okay. uh, we so have the there. team working on precisely these anomalous issues. Another one, other quick question: um, Are you working with the difference between the brain as it works through the heart, which does radiate in oneness, versus the brain and the head, because I find them very different, and it does work well, with the shift of consciousness. Working, uh, the heart math people are working on that one very strongly, right. and the rest, some of the rest of us are cognizant of those issues, but I don't have any particular experts. Uh, well, that isn't true. There's a couple of guys that are interested in, in that particular area, and we're hoping to have funding so they can get closer to work right away. Great, thank you right, thank so you. much. Appreciate it. All right, sir, very quick, very quick question, thank you. Dr. Mitchell, yeah. I'd like to personally thank you for having the courage to uh, step forward on this issue, and I know you've spoken uh, for a number of years, but, but today I think you did make some history when you confirmed for us that you had received confirmation from the uh, level of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the reality of the Roswell incident as uh, not being a weather balloon or any other kind of balloon, but a, of actually being an extraterrestrial spacecraft that did impact the Earth. And I think you also confirmed that there were uh, alien bodies recovered from that crash. Is that true? Yes, but let me say my source <clears throat> that initially confirmed the questions that I posed, subsequently denied we met it, that sure, we even sure. talked about it. And right, right, you right. You know that story. I understand there's yeah. a lot of uh, classification yeah. issues involved, but I do want to thank you for You're confirming that for us. I'm glad I can be a part I of it. I think that's very brave of you and noble. Um, my, my only other uh, uh, question to you was, you brought up the issue of Dr. John Mack. Yeah. He was an abduction researcher. Yes. Um, have you ever been able to get any kind of confirmation the, about the abduction phenomenon as being a real phenomenon? <clears throat> well, I have, I can't say <clears throat> that I cannot prove it personally from my own experience, but I'm quite aware of many, many, many of the stories, the experiences that people have, and I, I take them, okay, these are people's explanation, interpretation of their experiences, but I am, I am not 
knowledgeable enough mm -hmm. to be able to say this one's true and that one's not true or whatever. I just accept these are people's stories and they're part of the lore. And John Mack and the people that have investigated them said these are not crazy people. They right, had right. an experience. Yes. They had an experience. Yes. It's been yeah. postulated, of course, that the abduction phenomena kind of works uh, if, if the reality and it's known in, yeah. in the government, that that will work uh, in some ways has worked against the disclosure process <clears throat> because of the frightening, rather frightening aspects yeah, of it. Yeah, except for the fact that there are so many very good people that we now know of and aware of who have told independently the same sorts of stories right. about uh, walls and mm -hmm. coming through mm -hmm. walls and these sorts right. of things that uh, you, you start to take it pretty seriously. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Mitchell, I'd also yeah. like to say it's truly an honor to have you here and, and thank well, you for thank participating. Thank you very much. Uh, I also grew up, you know, following every aspect of the space program and all the shots. And, and the, I wonder if you can indulge in one question. Uh, you know, most people are aware of uh, during Apollo 14, you know, Alan Shepard's golf shot on the moon. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think your people may not be aware. You also had the, the feet of athletic prowess. True that I'm sorry about that. You also had a feat of athletic prowess. Is it true that you threw a javelin on the moon? Oh, yes. And, and yes. How, did, how did that fit? Well, if you look at, uh, if some of you have seen the moon pans of our Apollo 14, and on one side, in the background is Cone Crater, where we walked, and on one side is me adjusting the camera, and on the other side is a solar wind experiment, and the staff of the solar wind experiment turned out to be a very fine javelin. So uh, when Alan hit his golf ball, and uh, went miles and miles in, in terms of 51 feet. Uh, but, uh, uh, and my javelin went 51 feet and four inches. <laughs> so that was the first Lunar Olympics, a javelin throw and a right. golf shot. All right, thank you very much. All right, one last question. Right now, here we go. This is it and we're gonna dinner take our break. Morning, sir. Good morning. Um, very quickly, um, what do you think about the uh, hollow earth theory the what piece? Hollow Earth theory. Oh, okay. And uh, also, um, what do you think? Uh, what What was our real reason for going to the moon in the first place? Was it just to, you know, go up there and do some experiments, or to see about whether it's feasible to colonize the moon? Well, first of all, I don't think. I think the evidence of a hollow Earth is is missing. We know there's a lot of molten lava down there and uh, still coming out. So maybe it's getting a little more hollow than it used to be with all the stuff coming out, but it's still a lot of mass down there. And the same thing on the moon. But why did we go? It was a race with the Soviets to, to be the first into space. But in a larger sense, to me, our destiny, our destiny is to be universal citizens, citizens of the universe. And uh, that means we've got to get out of here in due course, and we'll get out of here. And so that's looking at us in the large picture of what are we really? What is this really all about? And humans have been asking that question for centuries, thousands of years. They look into the heavens and they look at the stars and then they say, what is my relationship to all of this? Where did this come from? What am I? And we're still asking that question and hopefully we're getting a little better answers than our predecessors did a few thousand years ago. Thank you for being a great audience.